Scientific measurements are reported in a very specific way because um, we want to communicate accurately to people who may read this later, and it, it could be decades later. We want to convey very clearly what we mean. And that's why we're so picky about some things, is it, it means that we don't have to write so much stuff down. So in a scientific measurement, we report every digit that is certain, except the last one. The last one is the estimated digit. So we always include one estimated digit. And we'll look at some examples of that. Here are two tables comparing uh, carbon monoxide concentration in Los Angeles County um, on several different years. The concentration here is parts per million. If we look at 1993, um, this table is saying 6.9 parts per million. This table is saying 7. So a scientist understands that the last digit is uncertain. And if the uncertainty isn't specified, we're going to assume that it's plus or minus 1 in the uncertain digit. So 6.9, we understand that to mean plus or minus 0 0.1 part per million. That means that we're saying we are confident that it's between 6.8 and 7.0 parts per million. Any measurement has uncertainty with it. Nothing can be measured exactly, OK, for various reasons. Over here, there is only one digit. That digit must be uncertain. So plus or minus 1 in that place would be plus or minus 1. So here we're saying we're confident it's between 6 and 8 parts per million. That's a pretty big range. Okay. These numbers are more precise, and they're more useful than these numbers that are rounded off. When we record data, we never, ever round the data. Okay. And just as a side note, this is encouraging that the carbon monoxide concentration in Los Angeles County has steadily gone down since 1993. I know we feel like pollution is getting worse. The pollution is actually getting better than it was. Any questions? Yeah, it would be considered falsifying information or intentionally deceiving people. Um, to, to record, say, more digits than you actually should. Um, and, and we're going to get to the concept of uh, significant figures, um, especially when you do calculations. Your calculator can show you all these decimal places. And it can be tempting to just write all of them down and say, oh, look, I know this too, this very small decimal out here. But you don't. And so it is very important to be be precise in how we record the measurements. And, and this kind of stuff down here is, is stuff that scientists are interested in. Because, oh, well, this is the carbon monoxide concentration. Well, how did you calculate that? Where, when, what, what on? So it says that um, it's the second maximum eight hour average, and that's parts per million divided defined as milliliters of pollutant per million milliliters of air, and that's taken at the Long Beach site with that number, right? So it's all specific. Mostly we don't care about that stuff, but it's important to have that stuff in there so people can say, well, are you just making this up? Because the scientist is skeptical. It's like, well, I want to go measure that myself. I need to know how you're measuring this. The thing about numbers and statistics is you can really skew them to show what you want them to be. And so we need background. We need context from these numbers. So let's look at making some measurements. The number of digits that you can record depends on the measuring device that you're using. right? So here is a kitchen scale, and we're weighing a pistachio. right? We're going to ignore the ounces side because we're in chemistry class, and we're going to look at grams. So if we look at this black line, 
um, we see it's between the, this red line and that red line, right? So what do those little red lines mean? Well, there's one here that's labeled 0, and this one is labeled 10. And so we can figure out that each line in between represents 1 gram. There's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So this black line is between 1 gram and 2 grams. It's between the lines. Is there any uncertainty in that? Yeah. It weighs at least one gram. Is there any uncertainty in that? No. no. We can all agree it's definitely between one and two grams. So that's great. We write down one gram. But we know more information than that. We estimate between the lines. This is called reading between the lines. Um, which reminds me of that PBS series, uh, Between the Lions. Remember that one? Yep. Two lions at the entrance to the library. Very clever. Um, so we look between one and two grams, and we estimate, kind of mentally divide it into sections and say, well, it's less than 1.5, right? It's not right in the middle. So we may estimate that as 1.2 grams. That last digit is uncertain. We guessed. It wasn't a wild guess, though. It was a reasonable guess. It was a thoughtful guess. Are we all going to agree that it's 0.2? Nope. Some of you may say, well, that's so. You're off. It's 1.3 grams. That's fine. Both of those answers are good. Now, if you said 1.9, I'd argue with you. But, you know, give or take a couple numbers in that uncertain digit, that's fine. So what we're doing is we're estimating one decimal place past the smallest division. And this is an important thing that you're going to have to practice in lab. We're going to use a bunch of different analog devices. This is analog, meaning it's not digital. It doesn't have a readout. So here, the smallest divisions were one gram. That's the ones place. We're going to estimate the next place, the tenths. If, say, on a metric ruler, the smallest lines represent a tenth of a centimeter, then we're going to estimate the next decimal place, hundredths of a centimeter. If it's one degree Celsius on the thermometer, we're going to estimate 0.1 degrees. We're going to read between the lines. Okay? If it looks like it's right on the line, we still need to estimate the next place. If you think it's right on the line, then you're estimating that it's 0 0.0 or point, you know, you're estimating 0 in that um, uncertain place. Okay? Because if we had a mass that we thought was 5.0 grams, and the, the common mistake students make is they'll just write 5. Well, it's right on the line. It was exactly 5. No, it's not exactly 5. We can't get an exact mass of anything. This implies that it's between 4.9 and 5.1. This implies that it's between 4 and 6. That's a much bigger range. And so if the divisions are, point, are each individual gram and it's right on the line, that's not correct. Let's do some practice here. So here we have a thermometer. This is in degrees Celsius. That part of the thermometer is cut off. And before we record the temperature, what we want to do is we want to kind of orient ourselves and see what are these little lines meaning. Well, here's 80 and 90 and 100. And so each of the lines represents what? Those little lines. One degree Celsius. So the lines are one degree Celsius. So what are we going to estimate then? What's the next place smaller than the ones place? The tenths. So we're going to estimate to the nearest point one. Okay. So let's look at this. Here's the, the red um, alcohol in here. It's a little hard to see. It's hiding behind this. 
And so this is 100, 1, 2, 3. Kind of looks like it's right on the, the 103, doesn't it? So some of us may say, well, I think that's 103.0 degrees Celsius. And some of you may say, no, I, th I think it's a little bit above. I think it's 103.1 degrees Celsius. But by recording the number with a tenth place, we are communicating that we know that it is very close to 103. And it's just a little bit different. We're not saying it's between 102 and 104, because this thermometer gives us more information than that. And we don't ever want to just throw information away. So here is part of a graduated cylinder. Um, these are milliliters, so three milliliters, four milliliters, five milliliters. When we look at the surface of a liquid in a container, it has a meniscus. In a shallow dish, you're not really going to notice it, but in a narrow tube, it becomes very apparent. It almost looks like there's a lens or something sitting on top of the water. That's just the water, and we'll learn later why it does that. But for now, you just need to remember this is called a meniscus, and the glassware is calibrated for us to measure to the very, very bottom of the meniscus. There is a difference between the bottom and the top in this cylinder of about 0.3 milliliters, and that's a pretty significant difference. We always measure to the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, so the bottom of the meniscus is right there. This is four milliliters, that's five. So each of these smallest divisions represent what? 0.1 milliliter. So we've got 0.1 milliliter lines. So what do we need to estimate? Zero, 0,1. So the next, the next place over. So we find this relative to the lines. And it looks like it's between 4.5 and 4.6. So it's 4.5 something. 4.5, and then we're going to estimate. What do you think it is? I heard 5. That'd be OK. Anybody else want to say something different? 5.8. So we are going to disagree about the last digit, but we're all going to agree about the 4.5. Those are the certain digits. The last digit is uncertain, and we always include one uncertain digit. Any questions? Which leads us to significant figures. So we record measurements, and how we record that, the precision is dependent on the instrument. So if you used um, an analog bathroom scale, right, you wouldn't get as precise a value as if you used um, an analytical balance, because the instrument is not as precise. So we've got our measurements, but then we frequently do calculations with the measurements, and especially when we multiply or divide, that can cause an explosion of digits, because unlike you know, the, the problems in math where they all end up being whole numbers, at least, you know, like in algebra and stuff, they're all the nice whole numbers. And these are going to be messy numbers, okay? And so we need to preserve the precision of the measurements in the calculations because we can't take a measurement of, you know, oh, well, it was, it was five feet um, and I divided it by two and it was just an estimate of five feet. And I divided it by, well, two wouldn't be good. Um, let's see, five, I divided it into three pieces. And I'm going to say that each of these is 1.66666666667 feet long. But the original piece, I just kind of eyeballed it. It was about five feet. I know it's between four and six feet. So can I divide it in three and give that sort of precision for the individual pieces? No that would be deceptive, right? Could be fraudulent. So significant figures tell us, well, what should we round that number to? OK. 
Okay, so that's why we're, we're talking about significant figures. Significant figures are generally not a favorite topic of students, um, but the alternative is differential calculus, which I think would go over less well. So this is a little bit like learning to play a card game or a board game, right? There are some rules, and you maybe read through the rules, and you're like, okay, whatever, we're going to just start playing. And then hopefully you have people with you who have played before, and they'll say, no, you can't do that. Well, why not? Well, here, this rule. Oh, I forgot that. Right. So you have to practice this, make mistakes, get corrected until it starts to make sense. Once you've learned that card game, you don't need to review the rules anymore. You just remember it because you played it before. So the first thing we need to do is define what significant figures are. Um, they're also sometimes called significant digits. These are the non-place-holding digits in a recorded measurement. They're going to include all of the certain digits and that one estimated digit. The estimated digit is a significant figure. So if we have more significant figures, then the certainty of the measurement is greater. And that's why we always want to include all the information we can. We want to get as many digits as possible. OK, so this is for counting sig figs. Um, all non-zero digits are significant. So if it's not zero, you count it as a sig fig. So here they've put in bold all the non-zero digits. So thankful they did that because we're having trouble. No, we know what's not zero. Um, it's the zeros that are problematic. There's three kinds of zeros. Did you know that? So there are zeros that are interior. Some books call them trapped. So here, this zero is between non-zero digits. It's not at the beginning, it's not at the end, it's stuck in the middle. Interior zeros are significant. They always count. They are not placeholders. They're stuck in the middle of the number. Okay? It's the placeholding zeros that are not considered significant figures. So if we have leading zeros, they are never significant. They only serve to locate the decimal point. So here, point, 0. 0.00023. The only reason those zeros are there is to locate the decimal point. They're not reflecting measurement. 0. 0.04268. Again, the zeros are there to locate the decimal point. You may notice that we always write a zero before the decimal point. Decimal points get kind of small sometimes and hard to see. When we write a, a zero before it, it calls attention to it. Because if I wrote, um, if I wrote 0 0.5, I made a point there, but you can't see it. That looks weird, right? 0 0.5 grams. I'm going to look at that. Do I think that's 5 grams? If it's 5 grams, why is the zero there? So I'm going to go looking for the decimal point, because the only reason to put a zero in front of that number would be because there's a decimal point there. Okay. So I'm not going to mark you down if you don't do that, but I would encourage you to try always put a zero before your decimal point. Okay, so we've got um, interior zeros always count, leading zeros never count, and then we have the trailing zeros. Um, so. My explanation here is slightly different than the text, but um, it'll have the same outcome. So if you like the explanation in the textbook better, use it. It will get you the right place. It just doesn't make as much sense to me. So trailing zeros are significant if there's a decimal point written in the number. Not implied, but actually written. So this number, 39.0. That's a trailing zero, but there's a decimal point. Is this zero holding the place for the decimal point? No. If I wrote 39, I'd still know where the decimal point should be, right? Excuse me. 120.0023. Um, we have three trailing zeros. There's a decimal point written. They all count these two examples as well. Zeros coming at the end of a number and a written decimal point, you count those. If there's no decimal point written, 
I mean, there's always a decimal point, but sometimes it's actually written and sometimes it's just implied, right? If I told you, here's the number 300, write a decimal point, you'd know where to put it, right? But it's not actually written down. So those trailing zeros are ambiguous. We're not sure if they are reflecting measurement or if they're just there to hold the decimal place. Because if we took those zeros away, it would be 3 instead of 300, and that's a big difference, right? So what do we do with them? Well, we try to avoid them, but we can't always avoid them. So I want, we're going to assume the worst. So if we're going to make a mistake, instead of assuming that we know more than we do, we're going to assume that we know less than we do. Right? So these zeros would not be counted as significant figures because they are locating a decimal point and they're not they're, they're ambiguous, but we're going to count them as not significant. So there are measured quantities, and then there are exact numbers. And we say that exact numbers have un, an unlimited number of significant figures because they are exact. These are not measurements. So there are three examples of types of exact numbers exact counting of discrete objects. So I'm holding up some fingers. How many fingers? Two. Is there any uncertainty in that? Nope. We can count them. One, two. Exactly two. So if I was writing that down, I could write 2.0000000. We could go on infinitely saying zero, right? That would be tedious. So we don't write all the zeros. We recognize that two fingers is counting of a discrete object. Five pencils. Ten bathrooms. I don't know why I thought of that. Um, four colleges, right? Discrete objects being counted. So we say they have an unlimited number of significant figures. Or you could say that the number is infinite. Another example is integral numbers, numbers that are integers, that are part of an equation. So the diameter of a circle equals 2 times the radius of a circle. The diameter of a circle is exactly twice the radius. This integer in the equation is an exact number. And then defined quantities. Defined quantities. What's a defined quantity? One foot equals 12 inches. Why does one foot equal 12 inches? Because somebody decided that it did. We set up a system of, of units. It, it, it's, it's kind of funny because we say, well, we created this unit. You're like, well, that seems a little presumptuous of you. You're just making up your own units. All units are man-made, right? So we decided that a foot was going to be 12 inches. Question in the back? Yeah. So it's a defined quantity. The, the system of measurement is set up so one foot is exactly 12 inches. Now, can you measure something to be exactly 12 inches or exactly one foot? No, you can't because there's errors in the ruler because it may look like it's right on, but if you zoomed in with a microscope, you might see it's a smidge too short to be exact. There's all kinds of reasons why we can't make an exact measurement. So some conversion factors are defined quantities. Others are not. If you are within the English system, if you're going tablespoons to teaspoons or miles to yards, those are exact. If you are within the metric system, meters to kilometers, micrograms to nanograms, those are all defined. Where they are not exact is most of the conversions between the two systems. So if you go from English to metric or metric to English, most of those are not exact. 
The one exception is this one. One inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. That's exact. Do you know why that's exact? Because they redefined the inch. It was really close to 2.54 centimeters, but they changed it It's exactly. They defined it that way. So now that one's exact. But anything else is not. Any questions? OK, let's practice determining the number of significant figures in a number. So 400, I'm sorry, 554 kilometers. How many significant figures does that have? Three. That was pretty easy. There aren't any zeros in it. We know this is not an exact number because kilometer is not an object that can be counted. It's a unit of measurement. 1.01 times 10 to the fifth meters. Three. In scientific notation, the decimal portion of the number, all of those digits will be significant. The times 10 to the fifth part, the 10 to the power, that's the placeholding part. Whether it's making it smaller than one or larger than one, that's the placeholder. So times 10 to the fifth doesn't count as sig figs, but everything before the time sign does. So that's three. 1.4500 kilometers. Five. So we have some zeros here. Those zeros come at the end of the number. There's a decimal point. They are not being used as placeholders, so we count them. So five. Seven pennies. Infinite. So we could say infinite number of significant figures. We could say unlimited. It's easier to say than it is to write, apparently. Or we could say that is an exact number. I'm not going to be, you know, if it's a written question, I'm not going to be super picky about how exactly you express it. But if you tell me that has one significant figure, you're wrong. Because we can count out exactly seven pennies. Okay, 0 0.00099 seconds. Two. So the zeros here at the beginning are just holding the decimal place. Because we don't want this to be 0.99 seconds. We need those zeros to hold the decimal place so they don't count two significant figures. 21,000 meters. We're going to say two. Technically, it's ambiguous. We're not sure if some of those zeros are significant or not. So we're going to assume the worst, and we're going to say that one has two significant figures. Any questions? Yeah? What if it was like 50,000? That's a good question. It's actually on the worksheet. Yeah. So 50 Kelvin. Let's think about that. So that's a trailing zero, and there's no decimal point, right? So that would tell us it's not a significant figure. So it would just be one. But then some, sometimes I think students will look at that and they'll say, well, but that's a whole number. You know, that, that's a counting number. I can count Kelvins. No, you can't count Kelvins. Kelvins are not objects, right? It's like counting ounces. How do you count ounces? You can measure them, but you can't count them. OK, so that one does have one significant figure. And we put things like that into the worksheets to, to you know, give you a little challenge to help you think about stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes what you come up with is, is a little disturbing, right? Well, how can that be just one significant figure? Well, however this was measured, the, the person who measured it is saying, there's uncertainty in the five. It's between 40 and 60 Kelvin. Now, why might you do that? Well, that's really, really cold. It's, it's more difficult to make measurements down there. And sometimes, you know, an estimate is all we need. And so when we record that, we record it precisely 50 as opposed to 50 with a decimal point or 50.0 because we don't want to mislead people into thinking that we measured it to the nearest tenth of a Kelvin when we didn't. OK? Any other questions? So when we do calculations, the result of the calculation needs to reflect the precision of the measured quantities. And we're not, 
We shouldn't be losing or gaining precision by doing math operations, because um, that would be fraudulent, really. So there are two classifications of operations that we're going to look at. The first is multiplication and division. So these are like opposites of each other. They're, they're related to each other. So they have the same rule. The rule is that the result of multiplication or division carries the same number of significant figures as the factor with the fewest significant figures. So multiplying and dividing, we're looking at number of sig figs. When we, we talk about adding and subtracting, it's going to be number of decimal places. So this is number of significant figures. So I've got a couple of examples here. So 1.052 times 12.504 times 0.53. Do it on your calculator. It'll show you something like that. Write it down. And then go back and look. OK, this number has four sig figs. This one has five. And this one only has two, because the leading zero doesn't count. So then I have to identify which is smaller, four, five, or two. Well, that's easy, two. So I need to round this number off to two significant figures. And we'll talk about rounding more in a little bit. But that's the second digit. That is going to be my last digit. So I'm going to write 6.7. And some students are bothered by that because, but I, but I got this number on the calculator. And why do I have to get rid of some of it? Because it doesn't mean anything. The part that we're getting rid of is not meaningful. And it, it lulls us into thinking that we know more than we do. Um, here's another one, this number divided by that number. We get this result on the calculator. We're going to look at how many sig figs. Okay, this one has five. Those are trapped zeros, they count. This one has three, trailing zero with a decimal point. So three is smaller, so we're going to round this to three significant figures. The zero at the beginning doesn't count. That's a common mistake. Students will start counting at the zero. You don't count from the zero, you count from the first non zero digit. So one, two, Three. There's the third significant figure, and I'm going to round it and call it 0.626. Any questions? Adding and subtracting, the result carries the same number of decimal places as the quantity with the fewest decimal places. This is one that's a little uh, more challenging for students to get their brains around. Well, I guess this is actually missing um, an operation sign here as a plus. So there, I'm going to explain this to you in, I think, three different ways. One, the first thing to do is just do the math on your calculator and write the value down. Don't try to do the math, you know, longhand or, or anything like that. One way to approach this is to look at the number of decimal places. That's the number of digits after the decimal. Whether they're significant, like this zero is not a significant digit, but it is a decimal place. And so this one has three decimal places. This one has two decimal places. This one has four decimal places. The fewest number of decimal places is two. So I want to round my answer to two decimal places. Okay. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is to stack them up like you were going to add them by hand. When we do that, we always put the decimal points right on top of each other. Write the answer below, being careful to line up all your digits in columns. Okay. Then go across and draw a vertical line right after the digit where one of them stops. So as we're coming across, we've got ones, we've got point ones, we've got point oh ones, and then this one doesn't have anything after that. So we draw that line, draw it all the way down, and that tells us where our number is supposed to stop. So that's another way to think about it. And then we can also think about the uncertainty. So we can look at um, 2.345. Which of those digits is the uncertain digit? It's the last one. It's always the last digit that's uncertain. So which one is it? The two, the three, the four, or the five? five. The five. Thank you. OK. So 0 0.07, it's the seven. It's the last digit. 
So it's the last digit in each of these. So let's think about what would be happening if we were adding this without a calculator. So this column over here, there's nothing and nothing and five. Are these actually zeros? We don't know. We have no idea what they are. We have to assume they're zero because we don't know anything else, and so we just say, well, that column's five. Is this five uncertain? Very. Very uncertain. Because the five was uncertain to start with, and then we added two things that we have no clue about. So that's a pretty shaky five right there. The next column, we're adding this seven that we're certain about to this completely unknown thing to a five that yeah, it could be a four or a six, we're not sure. So when I get 12, am I certain of the two? No, not certain. So that one's uncertain. Here, I'm adding um, a four that I'm certain of to a seven that I'm not certain of and a nine that I'm certain of. So when I add those, is the one certain or uncertain? It's uncertain because of the uncertainty of the seven. Right? If that seven was a six, then this would be a zero, not a one. So that one's uncertain. Whew. OK, here, the three. I'm certain that that's a three. I am certain that this is a zero. Right? It's holding the place, and that's definitely a zero. Um, I am certain of this nine. So when I add those and get 14, I am certain of the four. I know that that's a four. Yes? Yeah, so what happens when you, you're adding these and they come up to more than 9, maybe 14 or something, and you have to carry the 10? Well, the 10 is one digit larger, one, one place larger, and so we can consider that one to be certain. Um, it would be the ones place in whatever you're adding that's uncertain. Good question. And so the farther I go to the right, these are all going to be certain as well. 2, 0, and 2, and I've got the carried over 1 there, so I'm getting a 5. So we looked at what we were adding, and we identified and underlined all the uncertain digits. <coughs> In a measurement, we include all the certain digits and one uncertain digit. Right? So if we look at this, we want to keep the 5.4, and we want to keep just one of these, the first one. So we're going to round this off and say it's 5.14. Because we're not certain of this one. Maybe it's a 0, maybe it's a 2. And so the two and the five after it are completely meaningless. Any questions? I lied, there's four ways. So if we look at this, um, I said before that we assume plus or minus one in that uncertain digit. So this is point zero zero, and we're going to say one. So that's plus or minus point zero zero one. And this one has uncertainty in the second decimal place. So that one's plus or minus 0 0.01. And this one has uncertainty in the fourth decimal place, plus or minus 0 0.1234. Oops. OK, so the uncertainty in our overall answer is going to be equal to the largest of these the largest uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.01. So if this number has uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.01, that means that this is the uncertain digit, the second decimal place. So I gave you four ways to think about it. You don't need to know all four. You need to know one. Whichever one makes the most sense to you. If you come up with another way of figuring it out, that's fine too, as long as you're coming up with the correct answer. So let's look at this example. So here we have subtraction, 5.9 minus 0.221. So we can stack them up like this, and the line is drawn to the right of the 9 because that's the number that stops first. It stops in the tenths place. So we draw a vertical line, and that tells us that our result needs to stop in the tenths place. And so this is a 7. We're going to round this up to a 6. We'll talk about that. I'm round the 6 up to a 7. 
So we'll record that as 5.7. If you don't want to always be stacking things up like this, count decimal places. So this one has one decimal place. This one has three decimal places. So my answer should have one decimal place. It is important um, if you're adding things perhaps that are in scientific notation, um, then it can be a bit difficult to figure out the significant figures. They either, the numbers that you're adding and subtracting either need to be in decimal notation, so you can count the actual decimal places, or they have to be in scientific notation with the same exponent. So if they're both times 10 to the 5, you'll be fine. If one's 10 to the 2 and one's 10 to the 5, um, you're going to have to to do something. Okay. Questions? So when we're rounding, we look at the first digit that we're dropping. I call that the decider. If it's four or less, we just knock it off. If it's five or greater, we round that last digit that we're keeping up one. Okay, this is something you should have learned in elementary school, but you may have forgotten. It is really important that we not change the magnitude of the number when we round things off. So if you're rounding something in the tens place, the hundreds, the thousands, watch out. People do crazy things. So what could happen? So 29,472. And I need to round this to the thousands place. A significant number of students will tell me that it's 29. But I rounded it to two significant figures. Yeah, but you changed the value of the number. So I'm going to buy your car from you, and it's $29,472. But we're just going to round it to the nearest thousand dollars so we don't have to deal with all those digits and I'll give you $29 for it. It'd be awesome for me. It would suck for you. But that's what you're doing when you round this and call it 29. When you're looking at milligrams of asbestos or some weird thing, your, your brain just like doesn't use its common sense at all. It just writes stuff down. It's important to care about understanding. And when you get the wrong answer, it should bother you enough to find out what happened so that you can avoid doing that again. So I'm going to give you a couple of uh, ideas about how to avoid these sorts of rounding problems. So if I'm rounding to this place, um, I look at the next digit. That's what I call the decider. This is four or less, so I'm going to round down. This is closer to 29,000 than it is to 30,000. So I'm going to write the 2 and the 9. And then any digits before an implied decimal point, I'm going to replace with zeros. So I'm not just going to knock off the 4. I'm going to replace it with a 0. And I'm going to replace the 7 with a 0. And I'm going to replace the 2 with a 0. Because I have an implied decimal point. It's not written there. And I definitely don't want to write it here because that's going to tell somebody that my zeros are significant when they're not. But you need to replace those digits with zeros so that you don't change the value of the number. 29,472 is close to 29,000. That's rounding to the nearest thousand. Or we can put it in scientific notation. So if I'm rounding this in scientific notation, I'm going to write 2.9. I'm going to check that next digit. Do I need to round it up? No, I don't. I'm going to drop those guys and times 10 to the. And what we're doing in scientific notation is we're starting at the decimal point, whether it's written or implied. Here it's implied. And we're going to see, well, from here to here, to get this decimal point after that first non-zero digit, how many places did I move it? Well, it started, it started right there. One, two, three, four. I moved it four places. So the exponent is going to be four. Now, the most common problem students have is they can't figure out, should that be a positive exponent or a negative exponent? And I think the book talks about moving to the left is one and moving to the right is the other. That doesn't help me at all. 
So this is how I remember it. Is this a large number? 29,000? Yeah. Put it in terms of money. Is that a lot of money? That's a lot of money. How does Mrs. K feel about large paychecks? I feel very positive about large paychecks. So large number, positive exponent. If you have a small number, what do I mean by small number? 0 0.027. That's a small number. You're going to give me 0 0.027 dollars? That's 2.7 cents. What? So we're going to move the decimal point to after the first non-zero digit. 2.7 times 10 to the, we're going to move it one, two places. 10 to the 2, but then we look at this. Big number or a small number? It's a small number. How does Mrs. K feel about ne small paychecks? I feel negative about small paychecks. This is a negative exponent. Okay. It's important to get the sign correct because it changes the result. Okay. Um, we need to take a break, and then we'll come back and finish this.